we are uh, getting us a little bit sharing on different social media platforms so that more people can ask us questions. So stay tuned, wait for a few seconds while Miss Ellen Heed is um, sharing and uh, we can appreciate the incredible background behind her. There is a lot going on in that picture with the incredible skulls. And guess what? That's going to be the theme of today. Not skulls, but brain. We want to see what's underneath the skull and what's going on. So as she's getting all ready, I can tell you all about Ellen. Ellen is an incredible human. You know, we always talk about professionals. She's an incredible human. She's a so many educator she's going to tell us all about that but basically it's all about what's going on in the body and she's passionate about psychology anatomy body work sexology and scar remediation so we're going to hear from her the relation you know my passion for the breath so we're going to go and see what's going on under the skull when we breathe when we follow these breathing patterns i find that so fascinating to have the approach of someone who actually knows what's going on there so We'll hear from her what's going on from on her side of the world. And as you know, guys, we're all experiencing some troubling time. So it's high time we focus on our nervous system because our nervous system gets pretty much triggered these days. Good news. We get to apply everything we've been learning. So um, are you all set, Ellen? No, I'm not on the Facebook Live page. I don't. I, I'll show you what I Here's what I have. This is probably not the correct page. Uh, that's probably not. That's okay. All right. Don't worry about it. I'll, um, I, we will take the question that are coming on my page and then we can share it later once it's uh, Just don't worry too much about it. Yeah. Sorry. I, I navigated away somehow. And I, okay. Don't worry. Okay. Welcome with us. Sam. How are you, Mr. Lennon? I I'm doing great. I personally feel great. I'm a little on the tired side. I've been, I've made 25 videos in the last, since the middle of October uh, to populate the course I'm teaching about scar tissue remediation. So it's a lot of detailed anatomy instruction. And that's, uh, it's always fun for me to make videos and get creative in that way. Uh, so it's, a lot of those videos are about the nervous system. So I've been thinking a lot about it lately. Uh, incredible, yeah. And now we get to apply everything we've been teaching everyone. So that's, that's, isn't it the hardest part to apply to ourselves what we teach, what we teach everyone? Yes, I was just moaning to my coach five minutes ago. <laughs> How dysregulated I'm feeling. <laughs> yes. I play yeah. with, um, I don't know if you're familiar with heart math. Yes, I am familiar with heart math. You know, and I'm me measuring my, my HRV and I love to just play with it as I'm going through a stress. I'm just saying, all right, let's plug it in and see and yeah. see what's going on right now. You know, not when I'm meditating, but when I'm actually right. getting triggered and say, okay, can I be okay when I'm not okay? That's much yeah. more interesting. Yes, that's the question, isn't it? How adaptable are we under stress? Hmm. So Ellen, tell us a little bit about your work so we get to understand a little bit what you do, you know? Yeah, sure. I do a lot of things. Uh, before COVID got to the rate it is in Los Angeles, I did a lot of hands-on work. Since the rates here have, you know, some people say one in three people has COVID here in Los Angeles. That's the, the model that's out right now. I don't think that's accurate. But I do, I have opted to not be doing hands-on work uh, for the month of January and maybe the first half of February, depending on how things go with the cases in the medical system here in Los Angeles. So when I'm not doing hands-on work, I'm busy making content for my courses and I teach, I'm teaching a year-long mentorship program for scar tissue remediation presently. What, and I have what, is, what does that mean? What it means is I'm giving people all the background that they need to know when we can meet for hands-on instruction. The anatomy, the physiology, the nerve, the dynamics of scar tissue, how we pack our simultaneously in a session. When we're walking down the trauma road with a client, how do how do we make triggered 
an example is, you know, I have a student, uh, she's a doula, and she had an infant demise, meaning the baby died during labor with her client. How do you stay present? How do you stay grounded in those kinds of situations? How do you stay uh, able to help and keep your wits about you? That's what some people are facing <clears throat> in the world of birth and death. It's a transition period and things can happen. Lives can slip away. Could, and could, so, could you give us some, some, you know, I know you have a whole course and I'll put the link to the course. So guys, you can, you can, but can we give us some, you know, some key, key points here so we could get an idea of what, what it lo would look like? Well, it could look like in that moment, staying oriented so you can stay present instead of going into shock. Hmm. To remind yourself to name five objects in the room hmm. just so you can stay in the room and so you don't flip into, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to say, I don't know how to It's that freeze help. mode, right? We go into freeze, go this into fight, freeze. flight, freeze, and that's yes. where the trauma happens, right? That's right. So you're in the, the trauma of the emotion of everyone in, in this case, the labor and delivery room. And then there's this dead infant. You may be holding the dead infant. You know, what are you going to do? Mm. Here? I don't mean to jump into this. This is very heavy right away, but this is a real life. I just had a mentorship call about this yesterday. Uh, I have other students who are midwives and they're trying to find the language to talk about pleasure during labor with their clients because if they can stay more allegiant to their pleasure the pleasure part of their nervous system then they can think of labor more like surfing waves rather than going into fear and panic when another contraction starts to come and, and what I hear you say when you, when you mention f name five things in the room is it's a practical way to go back to the present moment. Because yes, exactly. The, the, the problem is you are focused on the future. How can I continue to live? And or you're, you our brains just go blank in a freeze state. We all thought can sometimes stop and we literally, fr our brain freezes. And so to come back into the present moment means jump it. When you're in a freeze state, you're out of time. Hmm. So how can you jump back into the continuity of time? And one way you could do that is say, I'm literally have somebody you can say, I'm going to name five things in the room. I want you to hear me say, do this, because this is a way of taking charge of the freeze response, if you can, while it's happening and have a witness. And that helps verify the, the reality of your experience that yes, you're in trauma. Yes, you're doing something about it. And yes, you can be witnessed into doing something about it. It sort of completes mm -hmm. the circuit. And so then the training is for nurses, is for professionals who could be dealing with people that are going That's through. That's correct. It's for doulas, it's for midwives, it's for massage therapists, it's for people that work hands on hands in the pelvic floor or would like to. And there are a few people who are just body interested people who are taking the training. It's not a requirement that somebody be a licensed professional, but those are the kinds of people that gravitate towards this training. What, why, why the pelvic floor? Because this is trauma. It would be <laughs> useful for everybody. <laughs> yes, because the pelvis is the center of trauma in the body. It's the place where sexual politics plays out. Sexual politics, gender politics, politics of identity and pro politics of self-worthiness self-worthiness mm. from my point of view different muscles in the body hold very particular kinds of emotions and we carry a lot about self-worthiness in the muscles of our pelvis we carry a lot about trust we carry a lot about fear we carry a lot about shame in the muscles that surround protect and engage the pelvic floor so i have no idea about all this 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 pelvic story but would that mean that someone who's kind of stiff in the pelvic would be meaning, you know, if I hear what you're saying, means my muscles are being tight around the pelvic floor, means that I'm holding on some kind of trauma there or something that I cannot release. And some kind of movement of release physical around the pelvic floor would help release what's underneath it. Would that, would that make sense? Yes, that's the idea. There's four kinds of tension from my point of view. We have biomechanical tension. Let's just say you're someone who sits at a desk all day, every day, and maybe you sit on one foot. And in sitting on that one foot, your pelvis tilts 
And because you sit on the same foot every single day, your pelvis always tilts in the same position. So the muscles on one side of your pelvis are getting tight. The muscles on the other side of your pelvis may be getting overstretched. And so that could create a biomechanical strain in the muscles of the pelvic floor. So that would be biomechanical tension. Let's say you were uh, sexually molested as a young person and you've forgotten. You don't have a cognitive memory of it, but you're still holding and guarding. There are certain muscles that I call the guard dogs of the pelvic floor, and they may be overactivated at an unconscious level. And that's men and women, right? That there's no difference between men and women. No I mean, they are, but it's, it's for both, right? Men and what, people with, pe as the way I say it is people with penises and people with vulvas, because yeah. not everyone with a, with a penis identifies as a man, and not everyone with a vulva identifies as a woman. Mm. But nonetheless, those are the two basic flavors of gender con confirmation. Yeah. But then there are people who have transitioned, and I've done a lot of work, of course, with people who've gone through surgical transition from one gender to another, uh, and they certainly have scar tissue issues because of the surgery that's necessarily involved in full transition. So that would be a kind of surgical cause of scar tissue. There's an emotional cause of scar tissue. There could even be a biochemical cause of scar tissue. Because if someone's blood sugar is high all the time, it can predispose the, the blood to carry a lot of fibrin, and fibrin gets laid down in areas of infl inflammation. So let's say you have endometriosis, you're a person with a vulva or a person with uterus who's having endometriosis during your period, that's an inflammatory condition. And then if you're also having high blood sugar at the same time, the body lays down fibrin all around those endometriomas, which can then cause your whole belly to kind of cement over. So it's a biochemical form of scar tissue. So we have these four families of, of influences that can create scars. So as you can see, it's a deep subject. There's a, a lot of information. So I just got finished with the module where we talk about integrating biochemistry, biomechanics, emotions, and scars, and how you would start to assess and differentiate so you can help what's really in front of you. You're not just going to go in and work on the scar, oh, massage the scar, make it better. You have to go to the underlying cause for that person. What is their, but not only the cause, but the limitation of healing for their scar. If they don't take care of their inflammation, if they don't take care of their high blood sugar, you can work the scar all you want, but it's just going to go back to dysfunctional and tight again. Helen? Thank you for that. My understanding is that we, we, all, we all store also issues in our belly, but would you say that's not completely true? It's more in the pelvic? Is that, is that, or is that both some traumas well, I would hold in my, my belly and my gut, okay, some so would be in my pelvic? The guts occupy the pelvis, right? Okay. The so colon occupies the pelvis. So in as much as the enteric nervous system in the rectum, in the sigmoid colon, in the descending colon, and even in some people, the way they're conformed, even parts of their ascending colon sink down into their pelvis. So that's a piece. Yes, gut feelings for sure. Mm. But and the whole idea the of somebody are made of smooth muscle. Guess what else is made of smooth muscle? The urinary bladder, oh. the uterus, parts of the prostate, and the blood vessels. And if you're somebody who's attached to the quality, the strength, and the duration of erections, the smooth muscle that delivers blood into the penis during arousal is part of the same system of smooth muscle that holds gut feelings. Mm. So I think smooth muscle can be uh, applied more broadly as a category to how our body processes stress in the autonomic nervous system, the ANS. So this gets us back to the nervous system again, you know, kind of circling around here. And, 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 and for everyone just to be super clear, the whole idea of having a somatic approach to trauma is that we can't remember it all. The brain has not always the ability to make sense of what's going on. So the idea is to kind of bypass the brain and go directly to the source, go directly to the body. And through movement, massage, and maybe other modalities, we're able to relieve or, or identify in the body where the traumas are held. Is that, would that be accurate? Yes, we're able to reconnect the dots. Reconnect the dots because our brain is from the places in the body that are holding trauma, especially surgical trauma. So we go numb. Maybe the surgeon has cut through a few nerves and that could cause numbness, but maybe we have associated the surgery with 
how many women I've spoken to have, who have told me, I can't touch my C-section scar. I can't touch my laparotomy scar. That's a scar that goes from navel to pubic bone after I had to have an ectopic pregnancy removed or something like that. I can't touch the scar. And they can't touch the scar because the body remembers the trauma and it says, in their brain and the scar itself. So what we're doing when I do through mediation is reconnect the body and the brain, the mental representation of self with the physical tissue in a very slow, respectful and measured way at the rate the body can assimilate. Hmm. You know, sometimes it's just laying a hand on the scar and asking the person whose body I'm touching, what does your body remember about this scar? Mm. Not the brain. The brain has its cognitive story. The body also has a somatic story. And we need mm. to connect up and, and notice if there's a difference between the cognitive story and the somatic story, and then hopefully integrate them. So, so then the body and the brain can come back into reciprocity. So I've, I've done some massage body soul integration where basically the, the, the therapist was getting me to feel extreme pain and meeting the pain and trying to feel what is underneath the pain. Would there be also some massages around that area where you would be trying to release the trauma there through massages? Oh, I think we've lost you. Ellen, can you hear me? Oops. Sorry, guys, we are. You're Hi, back. You are. Okay, yeah, the back. beauty of okay. uh, being live in uh, Bali, where we get <laughs> to experience. It comes and goes, right? <laughs> yeah, you, you have to breathe, you know. That's, those are the moments where you don't hold your breath. You know, that's interesting when you know, whenever you are, something's not going the way you want, you just hold your breath and you just, <gasps> okay, okay. And, and just, you know, I, as for me, and I'm not a somatic expert like you are, but just being sticking to, okay, whatever happens, I stay connected to the breath. And that gets me stay in the body, stay present, stay with the breath. And, and that I found very useful to just, you know, stay and not, not get into that, you know, fear state or trauma state. Yes. Well, the, the diaphragm is one of those muscles that, holds emotion and the emotion that it holds is fear freeze and if so, you want to stay out of fear freeze you've got to keep the diaphragm moving so when you stay say i want to stay connected to the breath in staying with the movement of your diaphragm you're preventing it from doing the automatic thing which might be to freeze mm, you're interrupting the, the question uh, i was asking the, the question i was asking before is around meeting the pain through massages so sometimes, you know, as we said, we, we store issues in our tissues. And, um, and I don't know to what extent it applies to the pelvic floor, which probably is a sensitive part of the body. But if there is some areas that are painful, do instead of just staying away from the area to actually get in there and, and actually get the patient to breathe through the pain and feel yes, and exactly. express what's underneath the pain, you know? Yes. Yeah. Would that something that you, you, you do as well? every day <laughs> when i'm working mm. that's what i do is like we're going to go to this place let's stay present stay with me breathe with me in this spot can you bring your breath to this spot that place where you know where there was a tear during childbirth and your body's healed but it's still sensitive to touch can you bring breath to that place mm. oh the pain's gone how did that happen mm. and it's not just breath but breath plus castor oil plus awareness plus skilled touch because you know you could touch too hard too quickly and increase the pain or you can just be with the tissue listen well and the tissue will spontaneously give up the pain pattern because it feels heard and seen wow wow yeah. amazing work you're doing it and well it's very uh fulfilling i enjoy doing it i'd like to get back to it <laughs> as soon as and, i mean i guess that's that's the part that is a little bit difficult is you know, you don't let not, if you're not a professional therapist, um, I, I know that I'm very reluctant for people to touch me who are not trained 
uh, because right. you know you're gonna move a muscle or a bone in the wrong direction so if you're not an osteopath usually I, I stay away but I have someone who is actually an osteopath and who is educated to, to, to somatic work and he's able to do that and that's probably that's that's quite fantastic um, more people need to be trained are there some kind of schools for that or how do you well osteopathic school chiropractic school cranial sacral training even massage school um, some forms of somatic psychotherapy um, sort of uh, sometimes body mind centering sometimes zero balancing sometimes even um, uh, yeah oh, what do you call it it's Peter Levine's um, yeah it's it's uh, wonderful it's it okay out of my brain it's okay but yes there are there are dozens literally mm. dozens of modalities of somatic psychotherapy that do include conscious work with breath conscious work sometimes with self-touch and even conscious work with being touched by the provider i think it's so important we realize now that you know psychotherapy takes 20 years we need to remember something before you get access that part of the brain takes forever and you know really the the breath and the body can be the shortcut to whatever is going on more. underneath there. Yeah, the body is the shortcut. Yeah. If the body feels safe, that's, that's the other the part. part. The body is the short, the body can't be a shortcut unless it feels safe. Mm. Yeah, so, so developing a sense of resource and safety in the body. Um, in fact, uh, I think it was uh, Bessel van der Kolk who said, you know, one of the preeminent somatic psychologists in the field said a body can't heal unless it feels safe to touch and be touched mm. and wow you know for somebody who is not a trained massage therapist to say that mm. really made an impact on me i yeah. thought wow that that's a bold statement to make because here's a guy who um is a psychotherapist and he's talking about touch and that's you know that would cross professional boundaries but he's saying in essence the shortcut to resource is the body can you tell us maybe some a story of maybe one of your patients without names of course but some someone who maybe didn't remember an event and through your work were able to relieve that and then release eventually just so people to get an idea of what the, the process yeah, would look I like a, there was a young woman on my table who uh had been molested but she didn't know that she'd been molested and i was when i work with people i sit on the table with them so what so was the like, symptom? Why did she come initially? What was what got she her to had join? Knee problems and pelvic problems when she would run. She had a lot of pain in her knee when she would run, and I, she had a lot of tension in her thigh muscles, in her inner leg muscles, in her hamstrings. Mm. And when I see 365 degrees around the leg tension, I go, "Well, how much of?" And she was flexible, and I'm like, "Okay, well, wait a minute." If it's not biomechanics, and she was clean in her blood, she ate really clean. She was very careful about her diet. So it's not biomechanical. It's not biochemical. I think that leaves emotion and scar, and she'd never had any injuries except for this knee problem she was having, which was more of an alignment thing. You know, no surgeries or anything like that. No falls or displacements, dislocations, none of that. So that leaves, you know, by process of elimination, it's emotional. And I thought, well, if it's emotional, let's see what happens if I just sit with her with my hands on her pelvic bones and ask her pelvis what it remembers. And she dropped into this memory and she said, it's almost like she was hypnotized, but she wasn't. She said, I can remember when I was five years old, I saw my brother hide his underwear, my cousin, I think it was a cousin. I think I saw my cousin hide his underwear at the back of the drawer. I said, how old was your cousin? He said, 12. And I was like, you're five, he's 12, he's hiding his underwear. Why was he hiding his underwear? Because he didn't want anyone to see what was in it, she said. She knew, her body knew. And I'm like, okay, he's using his access to this five-year-old as an opportunity to masturbate. 
and her body's remembering that and it doesn't feel good and so she's holding a lot of guarding tension in her pelvis and she's like oh my god i this this makes so much sense and then she tells me this elaborate memory not just what the body remembered like we're stepping through the memory as it actually occurred but then she said oh and i know why this happened and now i understand why my aunt said this and now i know all this context started to un unravel for her and that helped her to relax in her pelvis so that her knee pain resolved there's an example wow wow hmm. Thank you for yeah, that story. I hear a lot of things like that on the table. And then when we um, connected, I was fascinated by actually not at all that all that work, but what you were doing with the brain. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's interesting that, okay, you, you do this somatic work with the pelvic floor and you do an old course that's, I think, fascinating. And I will advise people to take on your course for sure. I think that would be useful for anyone who's in the healing healing world and tell us about why you were also interested in going to the brain what's going on there and and your take on yeah well, you, yeah, you have a very well, unique approach to that i do i think about the brain not only anatomically but also energetically and i think we have centers of let me just say energy centers within our brain and energy centers within our body. And a lot of us are walking around like there's a wall between the brain and the body. And I'm interested in dissolving the wall between the brain and the body so they can act as an integrated whole. If our bodies, and I've, um, this is a, a kind of an interesting element of full disclosure. I know what happens when the body is without a brain. I used to exp I used to live with a plant shaman and we did a lot of experimenting with a drug called salvia divinorum. And what would happen is when you came on to salvia divinorum, it happened very quickly, like within 30 seconds, the body would start to move out of control. And the person who was moving had no idea their body was moving. And sometimes they'd have to be restrained. And we were the first to describe the diterpenes in the salvinorin compounds. Uh, and my partner at that time was the first person to actually um, understand the route of uptake of the compound of the hallucinogenic compound in that particular plant, salvia divinorum. And he went on to write lots of papers and, and become a researcher around this particular plant. But we were experimenting and trying to understand. I'm like, wow, the body without a brain is clumsy and unsafe. But then uh, we also worked in the tech world and we had a lot of opportunity to see a lot of opportunities to see people who were brains with no body. <laughs> you know, <laughs> people who live so entirely in their head. They have no connection to their emotions or to the, their physical health, that their body, they think, is some kind of machine that if they program their brain properly, the body will just somehow spontaneously follow along. But then they'd get sick. You know, if they got an autoimmune disorder or they got pneumonia or they got diabetes or they were a drug addict, you know, there were things in the body that didn't add up. They couldn't fix it with their head. So I was looking at these two, here's the body without a brain, here's the brain without a body. How do you actually practically integrate the two? What happens when the body and the brain are in coherent resonance with each other as opposed to fighting each other or ignoring each other, like a couple who are on the verge of divorce? <laughs> You know, ever since Descartes, we've been the couple on a verge of divorce between brain body and the divide between the two. So um, I think my uh, experiences with plant teachers really put me into looking at the body and the brain from a very particular and a very different perspective. I got very powerful uh, anatomy lessons downloaded from ayahuasca in my very first few journeys. 
before I had any interest in being a healer or, you know, doing what I do. I had no, I was, you know, I was in the garment business, the garment business and the plant uh, research business. I had nothing to do with bodies in touch or anything at that point, but I got this information just came in and I'm like, huh, okay. Now I know everything about the intestines and how they work. <laughs> okay. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and I just started to put it away. And then I met a man who was able to show me with his hands how to get the body and the brain to talk to each other in a very coherent and resonant and powerful way. And that's where the breath come in. Absolutely. And open breath is the prerequisite for a good body brain connection. Hmm. That's the entry point. And hence, you know, the popularity of yoga and then breath work and yoga and breath work together yoga breath work and cold as you know a stress an added stressor that kind of really enforces attention to the body in a very undeniable way <laughs> there's nothing like a tub full of ice to catch your attention and hold it for a minute right <laughs> so can you can you tell us and that's you know i do that every morning so can you tell us a little bit what's going on um when we get into an ice bath from your perspective? Well, I think the body is invited to go into shock and then we must use our breath to stop or interrupt that process. Hmm. Instead of going into literal freeze because we're in freezing water, we must regulate our body. We must directly um, dialogue with our autonomic nervous system, which is supposedly outside of conscious control. But what the cold practices are offering is a gateway into conscious communication with this unconscious part of our nervous system. So it's, and, and for me, it's kind of a training myself for when I'm experiencing that in an undesired situation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easy because I've chosen to go into a nice bath so I, I can consciously practice this. But then when I'm experiencing something that is not welcome, that is putting me in the same situation, all of a sudden, my body has a memory of it and, and, and has been training for it. So, oh, I, I, know, I know that. I've done that this morning. I know the feeling. So I'm able yes, I to- remember. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> the stress of the ice bath, I, it wasn't so different than this situation that's happening, right? But I could- be comfortable in the ice bath mm. can i be comfortable meeting this particular demon you know whether it's a person or a situation that's really challenging can we stay connected to our body can we stay connected to our breath can we stay in a state of presence and in a state of awareness while this thing is unfolding that we might otherwise freeze to protect ourselves from or engage in fight or run away from in flight you know, we don't have to jump into these more instinctual options. We could stay present and pay attention. Thank you, Ellen. Ellen, you know, there is one practice called, you know, either it's connected breath or a tropic breath work. We breath, you've got all these breathing practices, which mm. in a nutshell are kind of controlled hyperventilation mm -hmm. and you're, you're lowering your CO2. <sighs> your CO2 level is going down and uh, with the bore effect, you are getting less oxygen delivered to your organs when you do this. All of a sudden, you are getting into this altered state of consciousness. You're, uh, can you tell us a little bit again from your perspective, what's going on in the brain in, in, in when you are practicing these this one hour breath journeys? Do, do you have any? Yeah. There's not much research on all that. So I'm, 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 I'm curious, what's your opinion? many things are happening you're changing the biochemistry of the body by changing the co2 to o2 and that can provoke a change in the ph of the blood and the change of the ph of the blood has an effect on organ function and if all the organs are i'm sorry let me just unplug this i'll be right back <laughs> we've got some life situation in Los Angeles too. So guys, if you're interested in all this work, absolutely fascinating. I really invite you to check out Ellen, who's a genius on all these things. You're back. I'm back. I'm back. Yes. Okay. I forgot to unplug my phone before we got on. Apologies. Uh, That's right. So 
So as the blood uh, pH changes, the organs respond to those pH changes in various ways and alter their function. You know, the liver has changes in it and the lungs have changes and the heart has changes. And when the body senses these changes, it starts to change its function and we effectively change our brain chemistry as a result. And when the brain chemistry changes, then we can go into a dissociative state or an altered state. But I want to say there's a difference between an altered state and a dissociated state. Dissociated, dissociated means we're checked out. We are not paying attention. We could be in an altered state where we're paying hyper attention. Mm. So there's a few options and we can learn to surf those waves. I remember when I was teaching myself not to throw up when I was under the influence of ayahuasca and I had to use the breath and learn to ride the breath and expand the breath through the waves of nausea because I didn't feel, I felt that the vomiting was a distraction. Some mm. people say it's necessary and you're just purging all the bad feelings, but I had been through a lot of high dose psychedelic experiences before I ever encountered ayahuasca. And I felt like I had really done a lot of the shadow work in those high dose psychedelic experiences. You did so it in wanted, a medical setting, like with people supporting you? Uh, well, I did actually. I was part of a, a test team for early DMT research back in the day. But I also, you know, we were plant scientists and we cooked up our own DMT on our kitchen stove. Yes, we did. And that was lots of fun. And I'd taken a lot of it. And also I wasn't averse to a seven gram mushroom trip. I was, you know, followers and friends with Terrence McKenna. I'm like, yeah, silent darkness, seven grams, let's go. <laughs> but that, you know, I encountered some pretty scary stuff along the way. So when ayahuasca promised this beautiful, enriched learning environment, I didn't want to necessarily get distracted with the vomiting. So I used my breath to learn to program my body to not go there through a kind of hyperfocus. Hyperfocus on the sensation, like diving into the nausea instead of avoiding it. What happens if I die? It's like if you see a giant wave coming at you, you can ride it or you could dive underneath. And I could feel these waves of nausea. I'm going to dive underneath this wave or I'm going to surf on top of it and use my breath as to connect me to the nausea yeah. so I don't have to uh, fight with it. I, I, when you are doing this control hyperventilation, again, you have less oxygen delivered to your organs. So I just, and I just want to confirm your take on that. So you have all of a sudden less oxygen going through the brain. And that's why we have tingling sensation, dizziness. Yeah, Would you say that yeah. because the, there is not enough oxygen, the brain has to decide, okay, we cannot give oxygen to all aspects of the brain. So let's let go of the prefrontal cortex that can survive. Uh, we can survive without the prefrontal cortex. And then let's keep just the core function of the brain active. Would you say that's why you reduce your, your brain waves and all of a sudden you go into that hyper-focused, hyper-awareness state? Would that all, be, all that be accurate? I think that's certainly a workable model, but I don't, I'm not sure it's the only way to look at it. I don't really know at the deep physiologic level, and I think it's actually different for different people. Okay. I think different people can cultivate a, a dance with stress that's highly conscious, and other people, depending on their experiences and the tr tr unresolved trauma in their past, might need to go to a more dissociative, less oxygenated place as an automatic coping response. I think different people, depending on the way they're wired, there's a variety of experiences there mm. is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's such a fascinating topic, isn't it? Yeah, fascinating. Fascinating. So and I think there's no one size fits all for uh, the effects of hyperventilation because people have very different experiences in those conditions. I mean, you take so many people through these experiences of getting to know their breath and the limits of it and introduction to cold, which is a stressor to the body. And I'm sure you see a variety of responses. Yeah, of course, yeah. of course. Helen, I don't want to take too much of your time. Tell us how to connect with you and how to, you know, what's yeah. next? How can, we, how can we work with you? Sure. If uh, I, well, very soon, on February 13th, 
in Los Angeles. I'll be teaching a little workshop, a 90 minute workshop on liver function and what you can do to love your liver in a caretaking way, you know, ways to support liver function and ways to know if your liver is supporting you as well as it might be. So there's a little workshop there. Uh, it's just, it's a 90 minute kind of a, I would call it almost a drive-by workshop. <laughs> yeah, that we're gonna re we're gonna visit a lot of information and a lot of pragmatic things that one can do for oneself in a very user-friendly sort of way. It's not a deep dive. It's a more superficial, but it's on a deep subject, which is the liver, which controls our our blood chemistry. So and for people who are watching this uh, in six months' time and 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 not not just yet. Um, you already have courses online available? Yes, I have courses online. I have a self-study version of my STREAM training. STREAM stands for Scar Tissue Remediation Education and Management. So if anyone is in the healing fields and wants to do a deep dive into understanding the relationship of the nervous system, biochemistry, biomechanics, emotions, scars, and uh, how the body works, how the body can be brought into wholeness. The bot, we don't heal anybody, the body heals itself, but you can set up the, um, the conditions by suggesting practices for people so the body can heal itself if you assess them properly. So it's an assessment training and a training about healing and a training specifically focused on scar tissue because scar, scar tissue is the unseen rate limiting variable for so many people's healing. Amazing. Well, I look forward to uh, putting all the links. You're going to send me all that and we'll put all the links in. Uh, yeah, sure. And people can reach out to me via my website, ellenheed.com. That's very straightforward. That's just my name.com, ellenheed.com. That's perfect. And guys, if you're watching this in the coming days, Ellen would be one of the trainers in the upcoming uh, 2021 breathing called teacher training where we'll be learning all about the breath so if you're interested in breath work and you want to be a breath work coach and really finding your own breath rather than following one approach to the breath but just being educated so you can find your style i find that for myself because i'm not following one uh, course i'm i manage to express myself through these breathing techniques and i'm not you know focusing on one in specifics and and you can adapt to your clients or to whatever people need instead of telling them that it's one size fits all you have to do this you know whether it's Wim Hof, Buteyko or Holotropy yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's so if you if you're into that um well join us breathingcoldbali.com happy to uh, connect with you all and I'm excited to have Ellen now I have much more questions I think Ellen we need a 10-hour session with you we can't do just two <laughs> hours but I'm really Someday. excited for that and, and um, good luck. And I, I look forward to our next conversation and to see you soon, maybe in person in Bali or in LA. Beautiful. Thank you so much. If there were ever a time when people need to be connected to their breathing, it's now. Yes. Yeah. So thank you for doing what you do. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ellen. And I'm going to stop the now.